as a company, you can claim whatever you want. And this is risky. It's misle misleading for customers uh, and it will not help us to fight the climate crisis. Speaking of sustainability, a podcast where we talk to front runners, innovators and business specialists on, well, sustainability and where they think their industries are headed and more importantly, how they can make them more sustainable. Hi there, this is Hani Larma from EcoChain and in today's conversation, I'm speaking to Femke Lotering, the sustainability manager of Oh My Bag, an Amsterdam-based bag company trying to change the way we consume products in the fashion industry. We talk about the importance of the use phase of products, how to find your focus in sustainability efforts and the importance of making your environmental data available to the public. Stay tuned. So hi Femke, thank you so much for joining us here on our podcast today. Hi, honey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really a pleasure. Would be great if uh, you could shortly introduce yourself and about your work at Oh My Bag. So my name is Femke Lotgerink and I work as sustainability manager at Oh My Bag. And I have a background in sustainable international trades. And here at Oh My Bag, I'm focused on, let's say, the social side of sustainability. So decent jobs, living wages, uh, improving the position of women in the factories we work with. And at the same time, also, yeah, working on the environmental side of sustainability, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. So improving our material use, calculating and reducing our footprint and everything that uh, comes with that. Sounds really nice. I think this will be a really interesting conversation to hear about how you tackle each of those parts of sustainability and uh, what you do to improve your products. I think in fashion, of course, it's uh, quite a... Uh, a task to become a sustainable brand and, and we will of course speak about all of those those aspects of it but it's really great to have companies like Only Bag who are uh, yeah trying to uh, tackle this in a tough industry like apparel so yeah. yeah it would be really interesting to hear about how Only Bag actually got interested in taking action on sustainability from a company perspective let's say through the lifespan of all my bag there was not a specific moment when we decided to work sustainably from that moment onwards but all my bag was founded in 2011 to yeah with the purpose of making a positive difference so it has always been there and we do not have a let's say a separate sustainability program but our whole business is uh, centered around uh, making this positive uh, impact. Nice. And I think, yeah, indeed, what you mentioned that the company was built on this initial uh, feeling of wanting to make the industry better and to create the sustainable uh, alternatives in the industry. I yeah. think that's kind of a, a common thread with companies who are front runners in terms of sustainability. So for them to really tackle it from the beginning of the, the business. But I think mm -hmm. you can also give really valuable tips for companies who maybe didn't start out like that, but want to improve their business uh, operations and their products now in terms of sustainability. Yeah, hopefully I can give some inspiration. So of course, especially uh, in the EU, there are now regulations that are coming up in terms of uh, eco-design. There's the eco-design directive uh, for apparel and textile which will, of course, focus on how products are built and with what kind of materials and focusing on uh, sustainable materials and also end of life in terms of recycling um, the products. But I know that you have already made a lot of these, these choices and these, uh, taken these actions to make your products more sustainable already now. And mm -hmm. it would be really interesting to hear what kind of role does measuring your products' environmental impact play in the design of your products already now? Yeah, so measuring our footprint helps to set priorities because if you know where in your full supply chain and where in your product design the impact on the environment is highest, you can take direct and effective action to do something about that. So for example, from our life cycle assessment, we know that in our supply chain, the international shipping causes a lot of emissions and also the hardware used in our bags. So that will be like the zippers, some hooks, some buttons. They are also pretty uh, pollutive. So we know now that we need to focus on uh, improving shipping. For example, shipping less by air, more by sea to make the mode of most of our, our partnership with the Good Shipping Program to eliminate emissions while shipping from India to the Netherlands. And also, uh, yeah, to try to find more sustainable hardware 
for our bags. And in order to do that, we partnered with uh, Wageningen University. So some students, they helped us to find better hardware for our bags, but it has proven to be pretty difficult. So for, for that, I could use some tips. Nice. I think for what you said, that's, that's so true. It's about knowing uh, mm -hmm. where your biggest impact hotspots lie. So where you should be focusing your efforts, because I think, as you mentioned already, that sustainability isn't something that just happens like this. You have to have the focus. You need to know where to focus your efforts on. Because sustainability can be so many different aspects and you can't do everything at once. So you no. need to know where you focus. And I think that's so cool that you were able to find out that the shipping and the, the certain hardwares are where uh, your actually your impact is coming from. So, or the, mm -hmm. a large part of your impact. And therefore you can really start to design with that in mind as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it definitely yeah. helps to prioritize things. There are so many things that we need to do, but yeah, this way we can make better decisions on what to do first and what to focus on. Yeah, and other than the the zippers and these types of things, how do you actually select the materials that you're using for the, for the bags? I would say that the main sustainability trait of all my bag is that a bag will last a lifetime. So it's a very durable product. So that is why uh, the key selection criteria for materials are also quality and durability. But that's also why we like to work with leather. Leather in itself is a very durable material. It can stay with you for the, re for the rest of your life. And it actually even becomes more beautiful over time. Uh, so I would say durability and quality are very important. And then secondly, we always try to look for the material that has the lowest footprint. And I think a nice recent example of that is that we have switched to 100% recycled cotton lining inside mm -hmm. of our bags. Yeah. Uh, before we used to have a mix, so it was 70% organic, 30% recycled. But now we have been able to make the switch to 100% recycled cotton lining. And uh, yeah, that will also lower the impact that our bags have on the environment. And I think where you said about the durability, that's something that has also been coming up a lot in conversations. So that's kind of focusing on the use phase of uh, the product's environmental impact. So trying to keep it in the, the cycle longer. Yeah. And that's a really interesting aspect. I also have uh, personally some hand me downs for my mom, one from the 70s, you know, that have lasted. Yeah. Her, and I think that that's really great that uh, I think both consumers are having more of a a situation where they want to focus on having things that they can have for a long time, maybe that yep. they can resell or pass down to people later on. And therefore companies like Oh My Bag are responding to that in terms of really focusing on that use phase and being able to design uh, for the actual usability of the, of the product. Yep. Really so cool. we also have a repair service. So we, for, if you buy an Oh My Bag, we will repair it for free in, in most cases for the rest of uh, your life. And uh, we also have a pre-loved program. So we encourage customers, if they don't use their bag anymore, that they can return it to us and then we will give it a nice upgrade and then sell it a second hand. And how do you actually involve your suppliers in the process of selecting these materials or testing out different materials? How does that collaboration work with you? Of course, we can do none of this uh, alone. So we need our uh, producers and suppliers to help us uh, with this. Mm -hmm. I think, first of all, it's important to carefully select the producers uh, you work with. So that's what we do. Usually before we start working with a producer, we have been talking to them for a couple of years already, and really explaining our mission, finding out how communicative, how transparent they are. And then after, a, yeah, let's say three years, maybe then we're like, okay, I think we've built a trustworthy relationship now so we can start working with them. So that's how it starts. Mm -hmm. And next to that, we have to some internal documents to help our producers in their sourcing. So we share sourcing guidelines with them in which we state some nominated suppliers. So for the leather and the cotton, which are our primary materials, we have nominated suppliers that our producers can only buy uh, their materials from. So the leather and the cotton come from producers oh. that we also know very well. Of course, it's one step further down the supply chain, but I would say they are equally as important as uh, our producers. Yeah. And next to these nominated suppliers, we provide, well, suppliers that are not nominated, so they can select them themselves, but then we add the requirements. So we say they need to have this certification. Ideally, it comes from India, where our bags are produced as well, to keep the supply chain short. 
that's, that's really how we help our producers. And I would say it's not a one-way street. So uh, they can also give us feedback on anything that's in those guidelines. So really working together on it. Nice. And I think that's so cool that you're able to kind of create that relationship with the suppliers, also uh, vetting uh, each other to, to mm -hmm. see that the, the process is as good as it can be and to maybe find improvements on both of the sides, how you can make the, the bags better and more sustainable yeah. and, and also make the collaboration more smooth. Because I know that working with suppliers is often, especially for um, fashion brands and, and these types of companies, is, is a tricky part of the process of becoming more sustainable. Yet it's a mm -hmm. very important part because yeah. in the end, most companies aren't producing all of the elements themselves. They need to work with other companies and uh, as you mentioned, that you have this vetting process of which companies with which standards are uh, good enough in that sense to yeah. work with yeah. my bag and to produce uh, the best product possible that you can. Yeah, I would say it's really a, a close cooperation and we could not do anything without our four producers in Kolkata, India, who make our bags. And I think what you mentioned about transparency being a really important aspect I find that that's something that's well in the sustainability world in general is of course very, very important without transparency. I feel it's, it's very difficult to really make true progress because you have to be honest about what you're doing and how you intend to improve it. I have a, a small part of an article that I found from Vogue Business, mm -hmm. which I'm going to mm -hmm. read quickly. Yep. So the Fashion Transparency Index ranks 250 brands with an annual turnover of at least 400 million on the information they publicly disclose about sustainability. This is across 246 categories from animal welfare and biodiversity to purchasing practices, working conditions and recycling. Notable gaps were in the production volumes, suppliers beyond tier one and garment worker rights. The average score was 24%, a gain of only 1% versus the 2021, a disappointing lack of progress from the industry so keen to make sustainable statements. So this was from a study that, that had been made about the transparency about sustainability uh, in fashion. And I'm curious to hear from you, uh, how do you think that we can encourage more fashion brands to become transparent with their environmental mm -hmm. data and their practices? Well, first of all, I, I totally agree with you that transparency and traceability is fundamental to being a sustainable brand, because if you don't know where or how or by whom your product is produced, how can you take responsibility for making it sustainable? That would be impossible. Yeah. To be honest, I feel like the time of encouraging only has passed. I feel like we need more. The result from this research also shows that truly transparent brands, there are just not that many yet. So I feel like we, we need more. I feel like we need international regulation, due diligence le legislation on maybe European level to make sure that companies take their responsibility. And of course, it's not easy. So at the same time, there should also be digital tools maybe to help companies work on their supply chain and getting all the insights they need. But I do feel like just encouraging not enough anymore. Not it enough. Doesn't seem to work. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, this article was mentioning. It's it's a industry which often has a lot of um, claims made, but then the mm -hmm. data uh, doesn't really seem to be there in terms of that transparency. Yeah, which is a tricky uh, thing. I I, yeah. I believe in especially in fashion, where I think that's also created a lot of mistrust in consumers and even more confusion. I think than there necessarily yeah. needs to be. So at this moment, there are no rules for making sustainability claims. I think in the UK, there's a new law that really tries to prevent greenwashing. But for the rest, as a, as a company, you can claim whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And this is risky. It's misle misleading for customers uh, and it will not help us to fight the climate crisis, for example. And how do you feel about, there are some companies that actually claim, for example, carbon neutrality, but they aren't necessarily even measuring their scope three uh, emissions. So for people who don't know what scope three is, that's indirect emissions that occur in a company's value chain. So things like transport and, and those types of things as well, which aren't necessarily in the company's 
uh, processes. Yeah. How do you feel about companies doing this, claiming that carbon neutrality without necessarily measuring that scope three? Well, let me start by saying that on my back used to make the claim of being carbon neutral as well before. Uh, we did and do include scope three, but I personally, I feel like we cannot be carbon neutral. The word neutral, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, we're a fast growing international business. Our products are shipped all over the world, produced in India. Of course, we have an impact on the environment and of course we have emissions and well, we work our asses off to reduce them as much as we can and to compensate where we cannot, but we are by no means carbon neutral, I would say. And including scope three, if you are a company that, let's say in fashion, that produces something, you have an international supply chain probably. And to give you some reference, we are still, I would say, pretty small fashion bread, not that big yet, but 96% of our emissions are in scope three. So yes, we can leave it out. It would be a lot easier because it's hard to measure, but what are we saying then? And what are we doing if you leave out 96% of your emissions? And I think scope three is almost always, unless you are like a service provider, where the biggest impact is. So you need to, you, you always need to include it. And also I find it tricky that companies are allowed to make the claim of carbon neutral when they only do offsetting. For example, through re reforestation uh, projects, I think compensating for your emissions only is counter effective because it takes away the need to really reduce your emissions and to adjust your supply chain so that on the long term, your emissions will go down. It's, it's more like you buy off your emissions. So that will never change anything. The reforestation projects, I'm just using that as an example now. We've had them for years already, but well, mm -hmm. we cannot really say that the climate has improved uh, over the years. So in my opinion, if you only compensate for your emissions without reducing and still making the claim of being carbon neutral, no, I, uh, yeah. I, I'm not happy. I wouldn't be happy with that. Yeah, it's too tricky. I think yeah. it, it all kind of goes back to the knowing where you're, you are at now, really having mm -hmm. that uh, accurate data, being honest with yourself to really look into all the facets that you can about your company or your products. So not leaving out any things. So also not only yeah. looking at uh, carbon, for example, but trying to really look at the other aspects of your environmental impact, which yeah. can be broader than, than just, for example, carbon emissions. Yeah. And getting the right data in, especially on scope three is really difficult. So oh my back's also not perfect because for measuring our scope three footprint, we need to get a lot of data from our producers further down our supply chain, a lot of information from India that might not be there. So still we need to rely on industry averages as well, but at least if we measure scope three every year in the same way, it's we can monitor our progress and see how we are doing. Important to, to also notice that it's not only about the total footprint, but it's also about carbon intensity. Mm -hmm. I said before, we're growing as a company, so our footprint will likely increase as well. And carbon intensity, that's a figure that shows how well our reduction efforts, how effective they are, but because it relates your footprint to the, your growth in revenue. Um, mm -hmm. So to us, that's that's actually a, mo a more important KPI than just the overall footprint. And of course, as we mentioned before, there's quite a few unique challenges, I think, in the, the fashion industry in terms of the sustainability and, and of course, also growth I, is, is one of those. But what kind of other challenges do you think that uh, are kind of unique to this fashion perspective in terms of sustainability? I think a root cause of the issues in fashion would be overproduction and overconsumption, which leads to a lot of waste. Many brands produce new collections multiple times a year for low prices. And it's just a cycle that goes on and on and on, but a lot of clothes just go to waste. And I think, I feel like this overproduction is pretty uh, unique for the fashion industry. Definitely. And I think what you were mentioning earlier about the keeping items in use, so the durability of the product mm -hmm. is an important yeah. aspect here, because if you're able to produce your product better and sell less, but sell better, that's something that a, a previous podcast guest uh, was also mentioning. 
then Mm -hmm. uh, you can still create value for your company, but you can create more of those good quality products that stay longer in use. And therefore, you don't need to produce as much in terms of volume. Producing low quality items will lead to more consumption. Exactly. Um, Yeah. So that's also why, as I said before, it's on my bag. To us, it's so important that the quality of our bags and the durability is, uh, is high. Yeah. It's uh, all goes back to that use phase indeed. And so, I mean, there are a lot of companies who maybe aren't where you are at yet uh, in terms of sustainability, but they really want to do the right thing. Do you have any kind of tips about how they can um, do the sustainability right or how they can get started with that? Don't expect everything to be 100% right on a short term. That's not possible. So... Uh, find out what your priorities should be by getting data in. So like we did with the life cycle assessment, for example, and then focus and work step by step. That's what I would say. Yeah. So really trying to find the the points for your company, because that can also be different for different companies, depending on the products that you're producing or the services that you're providing. There isn't one magic answer to, to being sustainable. And you're completely correct that there needs to be that information and that focus about what is what is that thing for your company and and yeah. that's a great place indeed to start off from yeah Definitely. also i would say don't wait too long or think it through too much because that will delay you so just start and learn learn along the way learn from your mistakes because i think that also makes it more fun more dynamic so you can think everything through on paper write all plans but Sometimes you just need to get going and then along the way you'll, you'll find your priorities, for example. Yeah, exactly. And, and what you mentioned about it not being maybe 100% correct and learning from your mistakes, I think it goes back to that transparency as well. So being able to really talk about what you are doing with real facts and, and also even if something doesn't go completely correct, just uh, talk about it and learn from mm-hmm. each other and these types of conversations that we're having today, I think, are also a part of that 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 whole dialogue of just sharing. And in the end, all all of us are in this together. So it's important yeah. to be informative to each other and transparent to both consumers and society as a whole. Yeah. So also for us, for all my back, I think if we share more about what went wrong or what was not successful, that might help other smaller or just starting brands. It might help them. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it, it actually helps them more than if we would only share our successes. Definitely. And yeah. a previous podcast guest also said something which really stuck with me, which was when you think about how scandals begin, it's not about what happened. It's about not telling about what happened, yeah. trying to hide what happened. And I think that yeah. therefore it's it's a benefit for both your own company and for, for others indeed to learn from, to be able to, to share knowledge and also the failures maybe. Yeah. On that note, there's a question that I always ask uh, our guests and that mm-hmm. is, are there any other companies or organizations or people that inspire you in terms of what they are doing for sustainability in our society? I would say, for example, if you look at the repair process, I think Patagonia is definitely an inspiration for us because they repair like jackets that are 20 years old. And I think that's super cool. I feel like we soon need to reach out to Patagonia to have a conversation with them because they are getting mentioned in this question so many oh, yeah. times. <laughs> I mean, they are the OGs of uh, of sustainable apparel, so yeah. it makes sense yeah. and should they deserve the credits. I can imagine that more people mention them. Yeah. And another company that I would say, it's not in fashion, but I graduated on social entrepreneurship, so impact companies. And uh, one of the first impact companies was the Greystone Bakery, mm-hmm. a bakery that hired people without a hiring process, so anyone could get a job there. And I, I feel like they really got people thinking like, oh, so you can use business to do something good it's not only about making money or profit but you can actually change something so that's definitely inspiring as well super cool well thank yeah. you so much femge this was really really interesting and uh yeah there was so much so much good advice about how companies can get started with this and and what oh my bag is is doing in terms of sustainability so thank you very much for the conversation and uh, speak to you soon you're very welcome you speak soon Hi everybody, thank you so much for watching this chat. If you enjoyed this episode, 
please click here to subscribe or here for more recent episodes. Bye-bye!